Um, can you hear me now? I was muted, yeah. I think, for a bit. Yep. So uh, thank you for this great talk. Um, it's very interesting. I have a few questions, but I'll just ask one now and see. Uh, okay. I'm curious. <laughs> um, so you have had these two parts of the talk, the first one on the um, vibronic um, terms yeah. and then the uniform electron gas. Yeah. Um, so I'm curious uh, in the, and, and you mentioned that the ions, the nuclei are important. Yeah. Um, so I'm curious, can um, the auxiliary field QMC the way you presented, could you also generalize it to um, to systems where you treat the nuclei? So basically having a background potential of the nuclei instead of the uniform electron gas, so adding basically an, an electron ion external potential. Would that be in principle possible? And yeah, would there be yeah, any cool. practical limitations? That is certainly possible. That's sort of my home ground, namely the ab initio Hamiltonian. So we've done a lot of solid state, um, ab initio solid state calculations before. And, um, and uniform electron gas is a good proxy for ab initio solid. Um, that's why we did it uh, for now. But yeah, it is certainly possible to do, um, you know, all the things that I discussed today, which is to have, um, you know, a realistic solid with um, strong enough vibronic coupling. And, and also um, we would then do find a temperature calculation um, in a way that I presented today. So these are all possible, just that uh, nobody has done it yet. So I will, I guess I will probably do it um, soon enough. <laughs> um, nobody has done yet, but yeah, there should be no theoretical um, challenges or hurdles along the way every step is well defined and known. So it's more like an engineering problem of having to deal with this dense Hamiltonian. Uh, we, do need a, we do need an efficient code to get lots of statistical samples uh, within a day or two. So um, yeah, that's, that's my answer. Um, maybe a um, bit of a clarification. Or I'm not sure that I understood Adila's question entirely. And um, did you mean that um, to, to solve the full electron ion problem, let's say for hydrogen, Adila, or did you mean like something like a snapshot where you just have the external potential and maybe some coupling in terms of vibration or something? Um, yeah, I was just curious, yeah, which is possible of these? So, I mean, yeah, yeah the first question, I mean, a follow up would be if it's the fully uh, coupled electron ion problem. I, I'd have another question, but oh, I see. I mean, would well, would the snapshot? So I guess you were answering for the snapshot, as I understand. Yeah, now. I, I got right. the same. Uh, well, no, it's not the snapshot. No, by snapshot you mean you run MD and take snapshots and run single points. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's certainly possible. But the approach I described today doesn't include any snapshot, but. I don't think it's actually applicable to full um, coupled electron and ion systems because we do need linear coupling. So if you have only linear vibronic coupling, then then we can avoid having to do snapshots entirely. Mm -hmm. Right? That's we can literally just propagate in imaginary time to target the ground um, polaron state essentially. Right? Um, yeah. But uh, if it is more more than linear coupling, then um, I think in principle it should be doable. But I, yeah, I haven't really focused on that so much because, yeah, this condensed matter um, applications are um, a lot of things. Um, we can get good enough answers from linear vibronic coupling, so that's sort of the main target we had. Uh, but yeah, extension beyond linear coupling is certainly, I, I don't, yeah, I don't actually know if it's possible, but I have a feeling that it shouldn't be too difficult. Uh, yeah, this is something that I haven't really thought about mm -hmm. doing. So in that sense, just to follow up maybe, um, so the vibronic coupling um, approach would be limited um, if I if I think about applying that to a material, 
mm. there would be a temperature, an upper limit to a temperature where uh, this would be ac applicable. Would that be true, the statement? In, in, in the sense that you mean that this distortion shouldn't be too too big. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, that is true, that is true. Yep, that okay. is true, yep. All right, thank you. Yeah. I mean, regarding the full electron ion problem, I would imagine that the ions are just too strongly coupled for AFQMC, right? Yeah. I think it should be straightforward to actually do, but I, I'm not, the detail I'm missing is actually, you know, this one body propagator, the action of them to the Walker wave function. Uh, yeah, for instance, in the vibronic case, we had uh, first quantized vibration tensor product with single Slater determinant, right? So the action of propagator should not uh, make the Walker wave function leave the manifold of the wave function, namely, doesn't matter how many times I apply the propagator, the Walker wave function is always um, in the same form, single Slater determinant multiplied by uh, first quantized vibrational displacement. And this works because, um, yeah, this I think this may actually be true only for the linear coupling because of the bosonic yeah, part. So that's that's why I, I'm a little hesitant to say it should be straightforward to do. I would have to actually check if 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 the propagator doesn't doesn't change this uh, wave function form, then AFQMC should be straightforward. If it does change, then um, yeah, we need to figure something out. But I yeah. But I let me actually see. So if I treat nuclei as as if they are electrons um then it should be fine i think uh yeah just the coulomb interaction between nuclei electron nuclei coulomb interaction kinetic energy of nuclei just the full um ab initio hamiltonian including nuclear degrees of freedom um yeah so that one should be possible i think but I have to think more. Maybe I should I should not answer anymore. <laughs> I haven't really thought about thought about this. <laughs> yeah, it's a research level question, I think. <laughs> yeah, thanks very much for the discussion. Um, then I maybe I can go ahead with a question. Um, okay. So the AFC the AFQMC approach um, that you use for the uniform electron gas. I mean, it operates as the grand canonical ensemble, meaning that you have not the particle number is fixed, but the chemical potential is fixed. So in principle, you could either um, ask, or you can estimate a, a, an average particle number giving you an average density, mm -hmm. but you can also estimate an entire distribution of particle numbers when you're really in the unrestricted grand canonical mm -hmm. ensemble. I mean, you have, will have an entire distribution of different particle numbers, yes, and the average of all of them will give you something like an average density. Have you estimated this distribution? And how much does the particle number actually fluctuate in the grand canonical ensemble at these conditions? Uh, so, I mean, we did look at the distribution, but they just look like a Gaussian distribution with the error bar of 1%. So the, the unicell we ran is 66 electron and 1% error, um, yeah, we saw like 0 0.66, so about half, half the particle. So that's, yeah, so it's a Gaussian distribution with that, with that um, error bar. Does, does this answer your question or do you, or are you looking for something else? I think I'm looking for something a, a bit else. I mean, I could imagine that the, um, that, the, that, that the average particle number is something like 66.1 or something. And I'm also getting that um, the distribution will be Gaussian of the average particle number. Due to the, but that is a consequence not of physics, but of the central limiting theorem, I would say. It's just a purely statistical consequence of um, adding up random yeah. numbers. But yeah. But what, 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 what I'm thinking actually about is that you um, that you write down your number operator and yeah. then compute the grand canonical average of the number operator. And that should also give you a Gaussian, but my gut feeling and also my practical experience is that the distribution will be much broader than 1%. So it, it, in particular for this weak coupling, 
Um, what we have found with the CPIMC method, for example, and what I also um, have seen in my first uh, tryouts uh, using just standard um, path in Rigo Monte Carlo, is that the distribution is really huge, that it varies by hundreds of particles in, in this regime. So I'm just curious um, if you see something um, akin to that. Um, when you say huge, you, you are saying if I were to do 60 cs, I do run into some hundred particle samples too? Or how, yeah, yeah. How, how do you do? Because, because the particle number is not fixed. I mean, the particle number and the simulation. Yeah, we, we, we don't get this much of fluctuation when we looked at it. Uh, yeah, no, not, not this much. That is interesting. So I... Uh, I mean, it, it depends, depends on... I, it's all relative, so maybe to me it's not so much, but maybe to you <laughs> it's what you're saying. Uh, but yeah, we didn't, so the number, so basically the number fluctuation is actually not, it's probably the last thing we had to worry about because other estimators had much worse statistical error bars and severe fluctuation in the estimator. So, Always, what by the time we have enough, like um, like a good enough statistics for uh everything else, the number operator is really sharply picked at at the number we want. Um, that's that's my experience. Now that's but, very interesting. interesting. So it's from for me, it's completely the other way around when I work in the grand canonical ensemble. That's why okay. I why I typically not. Okay. That's strange you are working in the second quantized space too right no no i mean um so my pre my, my former colleagues from kiel they worked in the second quantized uh, space with this configuration pimc method but um i'm a, a coordinate space person so standard path in monte carlo or also the segmentation blocking stuff right it works in coordinate space but but i mean the the particle number distribution it is a, a physical observable so in principle is determined by chemical potential volume and temperature so in an ideal world where everything works um, as we uh, as we think it does, um, it should be the same for all methods. Interesting. We do well. Number operator is the easiest one for us. <laughs> yeah. I wonder if there is a physical explanation for that. Ah, okay. No, sorry. Okay. Uh, maybe. I, okay. I think I <laughs> I actually. Um, was a bit unclear. I mean, the number operator, but the number operator will give you is the average particle number, and that will probably be as you say. So I completely understand why on the average particle number you get a, your Gaussian distribution, and also I get why fluctuation can be relatively small um, for you. But what you can also estimate is something like the expectation value um, of the number operator times the conical delta, meaning um, conical delta, let's say 60 particles, comma n. You know that's all that measures how often you get 60 particles in your in your simulation, or what's the what's the probability to have 60 particles in a grand canonical ensemble that is defined by mu, t, and v. And when I when I plot um, the results for these Kronecker deltas um, times the respective uh -huh. n, then then you get an entire distribution of particle numbers that can happen in your grand canonical ensemble. And um, so my statement is that this distribution is huge or broad, I should rather say broad. I see. Um, well, is it not the same as just spinning um, each sample of number operator? You, and then looking at the distribution? If you ignore the sign problem, it would be the same as spinning each, um, yeah, each sample yeah. operator, yeah. Yeah, I mean, when we looked at this, this one was the most well behaved, but yeah, we didn't really focus on this so much. So, uh, yeah. But I, I think just while we are on this topic, I think we should probably figure out how to do canonical ensemble uh, as well. I think yeah, it, yeah. it was a lot, a lot of pain was involved in actually running this uniform electron gas calculation because of the number number of electrons in yeah it's it's easy in terms of getting um small enough error bar but it's very difficult to target the right number sector so right, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
yeah, it was very painful. Another, yeah, but I, I guess you do have some applications in mind just specifically for grand canonical ensemble or I see, okay. Yeah. Yeah, so from my experience, it's always better to work in the canonical ensemble unless um, you're interested in some observable that you can only get in the grand canonical ensemble, like say compressibility or something like a Matsubara green function. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, canonical ensemble is very nice. <laughs> right. Okay. Um, anybody else with a question? That does not seem to be the case for now. Then I am. Um, just go ahead with another one. Um, is it straight okay. to, to include relativistic effects into AFQMC? Uh, this is a very good question uh, in the sense that I, I think real space methods have trouble in doing this, right? Yeah, yeah you can do it in an approximate or let's say first order way, but you cannot yeah. really consistently take into account all the... Yeah. Authors. You know, this... Quantum chemists actually do this Dirac Hartree Falk calculation. I don't know if you know this, but we, we do solve SCF for full four component wave function that is, that is still single Slater determinant. So I think it should be possible, but I shouldn't, yeah, I haven't done it and nobody has done it. So maybe I shouldn't say this with 100% confidence, but I, I'm more confident about this than about a couple um, electrons and ion simulation. So I think it should be relatively straightforward. Certainly, you know, that's doing spin orbit coupling is extremely easy. Uh, and we just generalize our wave function to two component cases, namely generalized Hartree Falk determinants. And this has been done before. So four component is just, you know, increasing the complexity by a factor of two on the wave function side. So I think it should be very easy to do. Maybe yeah, somebody because, has to do it. <laughs> yeah, right. But I mean, in general, in general, it might also be an, an interesting application to look at the electron gas and maybe at relatively high density and relatively high temperature, where maybe hard focus focus not sufficient, but relativistic effects um, could potentially matter. Or maybe just to hammer out when relativistic effects um, in an interacting electron gas actually start. I see. You, you get relativistic effects in uniform electron gas without nuclei. I mean, in principle, you should always get them, right? I mean, um, for sure, uh, I mean, if you have nuclei, it's a much more serious problem. And that's what you typically traditionally have when you do your DFT calculation, I suppose. But even only in the electron gas, I think, um, Schrodinger equation okay. or um, the, the density matrix derived from the Schrodinger equation eventually should fail. Because, I mean, just heuristically, I mean, the dispersion relation changes, right? Independent of the nuclei. That's right. But I... I see. So are you saying for higher density, it shows up or? I would think it would show up for higher density because for higher density, like the kinetic energy just skyrockets, right? That's right, that's right. Everything is too close and yeah, I can see relativistic effects coming out that way too. It's interesting, but it's, uh, yeah, if, if RS value is very small, many other methods can work too, probably. Do you know if um, CPIMC can be easily extended for relativistic effects? Yeah, I think, I think that should be uh, relatively straightforward. So also we hadn't I done see. it, we also would have had needed somebody to do it, but in principle, okay. <laughs> it was always in the back of our heads that eventually somebody should do that. I see. Yeah, I imagine, any second quantized based methods, second quantization based methods uh, can easily do this, I think. Yeah, I have, a, I have the same feeling. Yeah. Okay, then maybe last question from my end before I open up again to, to everybody else. Um, you also present results for the static structure factor and I don't remember exactly for which parameters. So you have accurate results for R is equal to. Do you have results for the static structure factor at R is equal to basically down to very low temperature? Uh, no, I, we looked at only one, one parameter set. Uh, 
yeah, that one was, yeah, we did it just because we, we could do it. It was not yeah, really yeah. the main focus of our work, but uh, yeah, we, let me actually, uh, so we did uh, RS equals two, and then the temperature was only, yeah, theta equals one. Um, and it was, it was just for 34 electron uh, unit cell. And that's the only data we, we have and we looked at. Okay, then you, you, you think lower temperature would, would be interesting to look at? It would be interesting because we know that at relatively high temperature, like the Fermi temperature, um, when you, so, okay, what we do, we come from the physics direction and we always look at density response formalism, where we have random phase approximation plus some quantity like a local field correction, which uh, takes into account exchange correlation effects. And the principle um, this local field correction, it should depend on the wave number and it should also depend on the frequency. But we know heuristically um, that the frequency dependence of the local field correction does not really matter, at least for temperatures right. above the Fermi temperature. So we do, we do have this local, and we do have this local field correction um, everywhere, at least the static limit. Yeah. So we can accurately compute stuff like static structure factors. But it would be very interesting to look at, let's say, R is equal to and low temperature, let's say a quarter of the Fermi temperature or even one eighth of the Fermi temperature. And then we could check whether the static approximation, meaning using only a static limit of local field correction, whether this is um, accurate at these low temperatures as well, or whether frequency effects um, do matter at low temperature. I see. Yeah, yeah, we discussed this before, I remember now. Yeah. Um, and I see, so this, but what, what's the unit cell you, you know, in the thermodynamic limit, I suppose? Yeah, in the density response formalism, we are automatically in the thermodynamic limit. That's, that might okay. be true. Oh, um, so. I see. So my, the my temperature is too low for other methods to run. Exactly. Yeah, it could be actually very interesting natural follow up. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I. Yeah. Let's talk again some at some point again about this. Maybe we should exchange some data and and write a nice small paper about this. Yeah, that would be great. So I would def definitely be interested. Then um, maybe again to, to everybody, anybody um, having a question for Jungwoo? Okay, so no further questions. So thank you very much for this nice talk and thank you very much for this um, great discussion. So it was very, very interesting and enjoyable. And I think everybody learned a lot. So thank you very much. <laughs>